Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Modernize Traditional Apps for Government IT with Docker and Booz Allen. A few housekeeping items before we get started. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent out after the webinar. We will take questions at the end, so please type them in the Q&A window as they come up and our speakers will address at the end of the session. I will now turn things over to our speakers, Banjo Chanana, Director, excuse me, Banjo Chanana, Docker Senior Director, Product Manager, Dan Tucker, Booz Allen Principal, Josh Boyd, Booz Allen Senior Lead Technologist, and Jimmy Fan, Booz Allen Principal. I will now turn things over to our first presenter, Banjo Chanana. Thank you, Melanie. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our webinar this morning uh, around modernizing traditional apps with, for government IT with Docker and Booz Allen. Uh, my name is Benjo Chanana. Um, I, I work on our uh, products, uh, commercial products at Docker. And what I'm going to lead, lead you through this morning uh, in the first half of our session is really a discussion around where Docker can benefit uh, for those of you running running your applications today, where, where Docker can provide benefit to those applications that you already have in your infrastructure uh, versus those that may be net new, uh, net new applications that you're building. And we'll talk about some of, the, some of the great benefits that Docker can bring to those existing applications. So with that, let's get started. Many of you are probably familiar with the fact that Docker is a great tool for building new microservices-based applications, and that's, that's all wonderful. If we could live in a world where everything was just a new application and we didn't have to worry about yesterday's apps or any of our existing applications, life would, just, would be just grand. Um, so we know, we know obviously that, that the large majority of the apps in, in, uh, in your environments are existing applications that have already been deployed. And I think Gartner said this, said this best. They said it, that 8% of the TCO of an application is at deployment time. So that implies that the rest of that 92% is really as a result of that app continuing its lifetime, which could be through that 15-year through that lifespan. You know, some of us who've been around for a while know that sometimes it's even longer than 15 years that these apps stick around. And many years after the app developers who've created that app or the, the maintainers uh, who, who know anything about that application are long gone, uh, you know, we're left continuing to manage and maintain those applications. And so the question is, what can we do for those applications? And where does that, where does that cost come from? Where does that 92%, uh, that where does that actually go? Well, there's three big buckets uh, that we're probably all very familiar with. A lot of it goes towards maintenance, and it's maintenance not, not just around the application and the continued patching of just the application, but also the underlying operating system and infrastructure. Now, if there's only some way we could decouple that application from its underlying oper operating system and infrastructure, and I'm, I'm sure you know where I'm, where I'm heading with that. Uh, second is the inertia of these legacy apps on that infrastructure. Um, sometimes it's just hard getting, getting application teams who are used to running on a given infrastructure to move to something else, whether it's a newer kernel or a newer Linux kernel or whether it's a new version of the operating system or whether it's even just refreshing the hardware. No one knows what uh, sometimes the, the connections between that application and the underlying infrastructure are, and so there's just that, that hurdle uh, to overcome in order to make sure you can move and even, even refresh hardware underneath. And then the last is security and compliance. Uh, we're all very familiar with this. The ongoing security and compliance and changing anything about the configuration or deployment or underlying infrastructure around an application can re-trigger an entire set of compliance uh, regulations or uh, security auditing. And so that, that creates a, a, you know, another, another hurdle for us to cross uh, for that. For so how does, this, how does this affect us? Well, we all know that what ends up happening is we go out and we deploy those applications and then we spend a large majority of our budgets, our IT budgets, on the maintenance around those applications, which means we get less and less. Every time we deploy one more application, we get less budget to spend on innovation. And so while it's great, we're building the next app, as soon as we've deployed that app, we incur the, the total cost of ownership 
for the next 15 years inside our IT budgets, but those budgets aren't increasing. They're generally either staying flat or decreasing. And so we're trying to figure out the best ways to do more with less and make sure that we spend less money on the maintenance and upkeep of those applications. And, and this is all stuff I'm sure many of you are, are very familiar with. So we have to find a way to cut into that 80% uh, of, our, of our existing budget that goes into just maintenance and keeping the lights on. So what we'd like to introduce today is how we believe we can start modernizing those legacy apps. Using Docker and Booz Allen, Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, we've partnered together to really develop a, a way in which uh, organizations, uh, government can take advantage of the capabilities of containerization and be able to start that modernization process, eat into that 80%, so start reducing the amount of, amount of energy and time it takes to continue maintenance on those, on those existing applications and start moving them forward into a modern infrastructure onto, and, and start modernizing them into uh, modern application development without having to change any of your code. And so this is using a lot of the basic fundamentals around Docker and Docker containers to do that. So what are some of the benefits here that, that Docker can provide uh, around, you know, around uh, modernizing these applications? The first is obviously portability. Many of you are probably familiar with Docker containers as a, as a portable container format. It's a format that can be deployed on any, any uh, operating system. We have support for Linux, now Windows with Microsoft uh, and other vendors. Uh, so the application itself becomes a portable container that can be moved independent of whatever infrastructure you're on, whether that's your on-premises IT or whether it's a colo facility. Doesn't matter what operating system they run, they run uh, you can actually get that application moved from one environment to another and across your, your software development lifecycle without having to change it. So that portability comes in really handy, uh, depending on whether you're doing uh, environment refreshes, whether you're trying to upgrade your operating systems, whether you're trying to do hardware refresh or maintenance, uh, or whether you're just, just trying to move it across your, your development lifecycle from you know, your, your software development, uh, your developer's laptops, all the way through to the production infrastructure. Security is a, is a huge benefit that, that the container environment can provide now. We can actually reduce the risk of, of access to those applications by using some of the, the basic capabilities that are on by default with the container runtime. <clears throat> we, can, we can drop capabilities uh, on, the, on the running application. We can make the container read only. Uh, those, are, those are some basic capabilities built into, into the Docker container runtime. We can then add additional functionality by, by providing scanning of, of the application and find out what application binaries are actually running, what it's dependent on, and be able to figure out what, uh, um, what open source licensing as well as what vulnerabilities are associated with that application. And then additionally, we can add, add capabilities like secrets and be able to extract those, those uh, secret information, the secret information that shouldn't be in the application embedded either as a part of, part of the code or embedded as part of, the, part of the runtime environment as an environment variable. We can extract those out, store those, uh, store those privately, and make sure they're available only at runtime, only on the infrastructure that's need, needed to run that, run that application. And then lastly, the efficiency of running, running a container much faster, much more lighter weight. It decreases the overall, overall infrastructure spend because now you're running isolated processes on top of a, an operating system that's shared and a kernel that's shared. What this does is it allows you to pack more applications on the same hardware without having to worry about a noisy neighbor or nosy neighbor type of, type of issues. You can, you can get the trust of running those applications side by side, even the same application of different versions running side by side without impacting each other, and yet you can, you can get greater density on the hardware that you have. So those are, those are three material benefits that every application gets just by porting over to, to a container. Let's talk about some of the efficiency benefits right up front. So 
On the CapEx side, if you're, if you're running inside virtual machines, which many, many customers are today, and we've all, we've all operationalized around the, the running of, of our, our applications inside these virtual machines, you can actually consolidate more applications into the same set of virtual machines that you have today. That roughly reduces your, your overall uh, capital expenditure by 25%. If you go to bare metal, you can reduce that even further, almost 50% savings. So we can double the number of running applications on that bare metal and get you get a, re a reduction in your server count right away. <clears throat> and of course, with that, you can also reduce the licensing costs of, of running on top of whether it's uh, you know, a virtualization provider or uh, operating systems. So alongside your, your uh, server infra infrastructure reductions uh, and spend, you can also reduce your operating system or your, your hypervisor licensing. On the maintenance and support side, we've seen dramatic savings from customers uh, using Docker today. 10x uh, increases in, in their ability to support the existing applications, which means they're spending literally one-tenth of what they used to on maintenance and support. They're deploying applications faster, roughly 75% faster than they were before. So just by adopting the format, no code changes, no changes in the architecture, no microservice transformations yet. We're, we're literally talking about taking the same app you have today, putting it in a container, and you're actually deploying 75% faster. Why? Because the packaging format and the runtime format is now standardized across every application that you have. So you're not worried about whether it's an RPM or an NPM or whether it's a DEB. You're not, you don't care about the specific operating system, specific packaging. Now you've got a package that runs on every operating system you run. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter if it's Linux, doesn't matter if it's Windows. And of course, new projects get the benefits too. You can, you can deploy those three times faster because you're not worried about how am I gonna get this deployed in production? What does it need to look like? We know now there's a standard format. There's a standard way to move across the software development lifecycle. On the security side, you know, we've, we've been able to see customers reducing their overall risk because the attack surface on these applications is, re is reduced. You're no longer worried about protecting from the bare metal to the operating system, its configuration, all the dependencies that go in, all the agents that get deployed on that operating system, and then on top of that, an application stack and maybe additional, you know, additional uh, files that, that get added there. Now you've, you've minimized everything down to just, just the container that needs to run, and you can protect that pretty well. You protect the OS once, and you don't worry about running any additional software on it because you can strip everything away. Everything you need for the app is in that container. With greater visibility to what's running in that container, now we can provide uh, capabilities that allow you to scan that container. And for many, for many operations teams, you know, after they were handed, handed a package that they ran in production, many of them didn't know what application binaries were actually in that package. They don't know what all the dependencies are. They were just given, given a, a, an opaque package to run. We can now provide greater visibility. So we can show them all of the layers in that container image and we can show them all the binaries in that container image on each layer and the risks and vulnerabilities associated with each of those by looking them up in, in uh, you know, your standard vulnerability databases. And lastly, we'll talk about this at the end, the secure supply chain. So now take all of the properties that we've talked about, reducing the surface, the attack surface, uh, increasing the level of visibility on that application, and now provide capabilities like signing, that ensure that we're trusting who created that application. We know exactly the authority of, of who created it. We know the integrity of it as it moves through the supply chain, and we can now establish trust all the way through the supply chain from the beginning to the end by ensuring the same container image that was created is the one that's signed off on by your auditing teams, your security teams, your QA teams, and then as it passes through every stage of that software supply chain, it can get signed and then deployed into production and that policy can be fully enforced in a Docker runtime environment. Portability, many of you are probably familiar with, with Docker's uh, capabilities around portability. 
But as we talked about, Docker provides that common packaging format, so every app now deploys the same way, runs the same way, is managed the same way, scales out the same way, uh, addresses secrets the same way, connects to the network the same way. There, there are so many advantages to, to ensuring that consistency across all of your applications. The common APIs uh, that are provided for not just your operations teams, but also your development teams. So now everyone's using a, the, the Docker API as a way to interact with that application, irrespective of whether, whether you're an ops or a dev. And that means that there's no, well, it worked on my machine, I don't understand why it doesn't work in production type of conversations anymore. And lastly, the infrastructure independence, which we talked about, being able to move not only across your, your supply chain and across the different infrastructures you may have, but being able to refresh on new infrastructure or being able to move to new, uh, newer kernels or newer, newer operating systems, uh, those, those are all very possible now uh, as a result of packaging that application in a common format that can run literally on any, any operating system anywhere. So let me hand it over uh, now to, uh, to the folks at Buzell. All right, thanks, Banjo. So first, um, you know, for those unfamiliar, a little bit about Booz Allen. We're really excited to be a part of this program, and um, you know, many may know us as a hundred-year-old consultancy, but we've actually been delivering technical solutions to the federal government for for over 40 years. Uh, digital is one of the largest growing segments of our business. We now currently have um, over 5,000 digital professionals delivering solutions for some of the the most challenging uh, problems across the federal government, and and we think about our services around four integrated offerings supported by a, a foundational mindset of, of open technology, architectures, and data. Um, so these offerings are, are enterprise modernization. So this is really the organizational change required to advance clients towards a, a digital transformation, the, the strategies, methods, and approaches to, to really help our clients adopt and integrate uh, innovative technologies and methods. So think about things like agile transformation, digital workforce, and enterprise integration. And then digital experience, so these are um, improving service offerings that improve the experiences that people have with, with systems, communications, and, and products at every digital touch point. So again, think about service design, customer and user experience, user interface, and design thinking. Uh, then cloud and data platforms, which is really relevant to this discussion. This is providing the foundation upon which capability is developed and delivered across the enterprise. Uh, these are the platforms that accelerate the sustainable, extensible, and secure delivery of, of software. These are our big data platforms with platform and container as a service and, and cloud migration offerings. And then finally, uh, modern software development. This is the capability that, that Jimmy Pham drives, and you'll be hearing from him later. This is delivering secure digital capability to meet mission needs, leveraging contemporary methodologies, technologies, and architectures. So think about microservice architectures, advanced DevOps practices, and, and site reliability engineering. So we're really proud of our, our strategic partnership um, with Docker over the past couple years. We have over 100 experts on our team, including a Docker captain, Normal Meta. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Docker captain program, these are experts and technology community leaders who were nominated by, by Docker um, for their contributions to and, and engagement with the Docker community. So we're, we're proud to have Normal um, as a thought leader on our team. Uh, we've also been working with Docker on a project called CodeLift, which facilitates the, the Dockerization of an application using a code analysis engine, uh, implements the process to go from, from source code to, to a Docker application in just a matter of seconds. And then finally, we led the, the first federal implementation of the Docker Trusted Registry, and this is part of a project that, that Josh Boyd will talk about later in the hour. So um, again, super excited to be a part of the program. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it back to Banjo to dig into a little bit more about the NTA program. Great, thank you. Yeah, let's let's talk about uh, MTA. And actually, let me just pause and say it, it's been a real honor to work with you guys uh, at Booz Allen Hamilton. I've I've had the pleasure of meeting all of you, and the the work you guys have done has been just fantastic. Both uh, Nirmal's work as a Docker captain, but I think your your work, uh, you know, our joint work together with customers has just been, uh, you know, 
amazing in advancing the capabilities around containerization as you know in general but and 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 very specifically as well to uh to our to our uh docker enterprise products with that let's um let's talk specifically about how we go through the process of now modernizing these applications we've talked a lot about what the benefits are um and and what some of those capabilities that that uh you know existing applications can can adopt from from just being ported into a container environment. Um, the, the methodology is fairly straightforward. We we've worked with quite a few customers on this methodology now, uh, and it's fairly very fairly well baked uh, from the perspective of being able to identify your applications and identify the ones that we think are going to be great candidates for for moving into into a Docker environment. So we start with any existing application, uh, and we'll talk about some of the some of some of the requirements there and you know what some of the best fits are uh to to starting with an application that can be dockerized we then take that and we we literally turn it into into a docker container and we'll talk about some of the tools available to do that um, with tools like codelift you can take it straight straight from source code in some cases where you don't have access to the source code we can do it straight from from a virtual machine image uh, and turn it right into a into a container that will run on the Docker Enterprise Edition. With that, uh, you can then take that application, uh, put it on a Docker environment. That Docker environment can be brand new infrastructure, can be an existing environment that you've decided to upgrade uh, in terms of its, its uh, uh, operating system or just lay, lay the Docker substrate on top of, uh, or it could be a, a brand new cloud environment, um, you know, whatever that may be, or, or in some cases, uh, you know, could be, a, could be uh, entirely new environment inside your your existing infrastructure. We then work with customers on methodologies by which they can implement the full uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment process, and and develop all the automation they need around the Docker APIs to then be able to deploy those applications more seamlessly into their into their environments. And then what we see typically is customers then move from an automation uh, flow. And being able to take that application and, and fully automate its deployment into then modernizing that application because now you're spending less and less time worried about maintenance and patching because you know how to deploy it and once the deployment side of the equation is is fixed and shortened uh, and you're able to do that more quickly then things like patching become much much more simple because you're patching and then deploying immediately you're not worried about trying to patch in place and then somehow figure out you know what's running in production versus what's what's running in development uh, and what you have source code for. You then take that extra that extra energy and you you redirect it towards modernizing that application, breaking it out. And in many cases, that that could be a very slow process. It doesn't have to be something that you take on right away, but you can take on thoughtfully and identify pieces of that application that need to be architected and refreshed anyways. You can consolidate those across applications, uh, so across across multiple monoliths, and be able to pull those out as, as independent microservices that you can then deploy alongside those those traditional applications and slowly migrate from old methodologies to new methodologies. But what this does is it, it gives you a framework for very slowly and, and kind of in a stable way getting from your existing environment, getting the benefits of Docker right away, uh, getting the speed and automation that's available from using containers and then moving into a microservices model. So what are the what are the ideal application targets? Where do I start? Which which applications are the best to start with? Well on the Linux side we've we've identified a number of applications that we think are perfect targets. So LAMP stacks, Java, Tomcat, WebLogic, uh, those are typical typical uh, application servers that we find uh, work work well in migrating from an existing environment into into a Docker environment. We focus primarily on the application or web servers on the web front ends, uh, things that are largely stateless today. That's not to say you can't uh, containerize your your databases, but that's something that we think takes a level of operational maturity that most customers don't want to try to tackle all at once. 
So start with the things that, that have, you know, very little persistent state or no persistent state at all. Um, start with those things where you don't have to worry about how you do disaster recovery backup and, and all the other pieces. You know you can, if you can put it in a container, you can redeploy it. You know you can, you know, you don't have to come up with elaborate strategies for, for how to make sure these, the, the data is fault tolerant and, and the data protection schemes are, are there. You then make sure you target a single app. So we make sure that we isolate the dependencies of that app and make sure that we move just the application, not clusters of applications. And we've seen some customers who've, you know, who've tried to be very ambitious about this and move an entire, say, WebSphere cluster. Um, while those, those are uh, great ideas, again, hard to operationalize all at once while you're trying to, one, learn the, learn the nuances of containers, learn how to automate around a container environment. Those are, those are things that, that obviously uh, you can learn as you go. So those are really the, the ideal targets. On the, on the Windows side, we've, we've focused a lot on you know, your, your typical .NET applications, ASP.NET, uh, and you know, IIS apps. So again, kind of web front ends, those are, those are the great places to start. And then what are the, what are the tools available? So we, we talked about um, getting your application from a VM image into, into a container format. And the way you do that is, is we have an open source tool available today called image to docker and the, there's one for both Linux and Windows. These tools allow you to identify an existing virtual machine image that can then convert directly into a Docker file. And for those of you familiar with the Docker file, a Docker file is basically the recipe for how you build a Docker image. Once you've got a Docker file on any laptop, on any, any workstation, you can then just run, run that Docker file, do a Docker build with that Docker file, and out comes the container image. That container image can then be pushed into a shared registry. So the Docker Enterprise Edition provides the ability to store those Docker images in, in a secure way provide role-based access control around the access to those images, and then be able to do security scans and signing for those images as they sit in the registry. And then you can digitally sign as a part of that build process or part of, part of the uh, push into the registry. You can sign those images and verify when you pull those images, and then enforce that policy all the way through to the runtime. So you make sure that only signed images are run, you know, Im images signed by, Say your your security organization or your your you know your final final audit uh, and compliance group, those those applications are the ones that get deployed into into the production environment. And so with that, let me hand over to to Josh. I believe is going to take it over from here. Thanks, man, Joe. Uh, so I'm Josh Boyd. Uh, I've been helping the uh, the GSA uh, run Docker for about the last two years uh, and getting them uh, their integrated awards environment application uh, moved over into a, a Docker environment on uh, AWS Public Cloud. Uh, and the company has been working on that project for uh, three years. Uh, so from the very beginnings of, of Docker before kind of UCP and Docker data center existed um, using just Docker engine and uh, being the uh, first federal customers of Docker Trust Registry. Um, to where we are today using uh, Docker Data Center, Docker UCP, uh, kind of auto scaling there. So if we look at kind of the, the Docker Enterprise Edition capabilities now, uh, you know, we can see that there's kind of a, a fully integrated stack, right, from the container runtime to the full lifecycle management. So if we start at the left and look at, you know, certification and support, of, you know, uh, in the Docker store and all the different vendors, uh, applications that are, um, blessed by Docker to, to be run and support by them. Um, we have the integrated app and cluster management, right? So orchestration of, of containers is difficult uh, if you're not using kind of this suite of tools um, and everything is kind of shown in these boxes, right? And then the optimized container engine so that the, the Docker engine is, is really kind of tuned uh, for enterprise workloads and integration with uh, RBAC and Active Directory and and those kind of enterprise type tools. Um, and then as we move over to the right, we see kind of more of a breakout of all the different features available, right? Um, so at the, 
at the top are kind of the, the orchestration type tools, right? Uh, the different policies around containers, how they communicate with each other, um, how we do secrets management, how we make sure that images are secure and are kind of running in the right places, uh, you know, things like that. And then at the bottom we see kind of the, uh, the engine capabilities, right? Uh, so security, network, volumes, um, how, uh, how the engine, the Docker engine is actually providing all those features. Um, so without uh, using Enterprise Edition of Docker, right, these are things you'd kind of be wiring together on your own, right, uh, rather than having a, a common suite that provides all the tooling that you need up front for everything from development uh, to testing to running in production. And so then uh, we look at deploying to modern infrastructure. Uh, so at, uh, at GSA, for as an example, uh, we went from on-prem uh, hardware, right, to using this as part of kind of a cloud migration effort and going to uh, AWS Public Cloud uh, for for running that infrastructure and with, with Red Hat 7 uh, and then picking up kind of infrastructure as code and configuration management along the way with the adoption of containers. Right, so now all of our applications are, um, because they're containerized, we're not, you know, hand jamming with playbooks to uh, bring those applications up anymore. Instead, you're just deploying that container. And every time you deploy that container, it's the same thing uh, as it was in every previous environment from laptop to QA environment to production, right? Um, so we've been able to, you know, consolidate servers, right? So. Uh, Instead of having an individual server or a cluster of servers for each application, uh, by adopting containers, you're able to get all of those uh, applications on kind of shared infrastructure, right? Uh, so that means we're able to do things like accelerating server refreshes and, and do, you know, cloud migrations at hybrid clouds as well. And then the other cool thing is, you know, uh, Enterprise Edition runs on any infrastructure. So whether you're cloud, whether you're bare metal, whether you're Windows, whether you're Linux, um, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, and you can also deploy your cluster across those things, right? So you can be on all three at the same time. Um, so you can be in various stages of your uh, migration strategy, right? And still be running the same applications in the same way and not having to change how you do your development, how you do your orchestration, and how you do deployment. And then the secure container lifecycle is, is a big deal now. Um, so you're your images as they're created, your applications uh, are scanned, your, your cluster is configured so it only runs uh, secure applications that don't have any CVEs. And then we're making sure that that image is signed and that the image that has been signed at the beginning by the developer is the same image that runs all the way through uh, your different uh, various environments. Uh, so that when security signs off, QA signs off, uh, we know it's the same image and the same container and same application uh, that has been uh, pushed through that process. And then we've got the uh, deploying with the Docker Enterprise secure supply chain. Uh, so we can see here, uh, you know, we're working with the, the traditional application here that, you know, has been modernized uh, and that the, the workflow here we're showing isn't just for microservices or, or kind of container-first designed applications, right? Uh, so we're seeing here that this traditional application, we've bundled up into a container, and all the same things that are used for uh, Docker to orchestrate microservices can be used to orchestrate those traditional applications. Uh, so you still have all of the same advantages of security scanning and signing and pushing that same artifact to that image registry. And then we're running that same artifact uh, through the pipeline uh, over to Docker control plane and into the individual nodes that are then uh, serving up our application. Uh, and the, the other important part to mention here is that we're also, uh, you know, this same pipeline works for this third-party ISV vendor applications. Um, so we can use that same workflow and simplify how we orchestrate our applications uh, for uh, all three different types of workloads. And then we see that secure software chain uh, being shown with the, the third-party uh, applications, which are Docker certified, uh, and then the microservices and traditional apps still going through the same kind of workflow. Okay. Um, 
so then uh, we'll talk about GSA a little bit and, and what we did to transform uh, the GSA integrated words environment into a, a common services platform. Um, so for some, some background on kind of what, uh, what the GSA integrated words environment is, uh, it's a, a system where basically all federal contractors go to, to bid on proposals, right, and then they're awarded through this system. So it's uh, a collection of IT systems and operations for those people who work with those systems and then uh, awarding uh, financial assistance contracts and uh, governmental transactions. Uh, so there's approximately uh, three and a half million users, it's 500 million page views, and a trillion dollars in assistance across 10 different federal IT systems, uh, and this is per year. Um, so the, uh, the system before we uh, started containerizing and moving to Docker was made up of approximately uh, 10 to 15 uh, siloed applications. So they all had their, their own kind of servers, their own uh, data stores for, for authentication and authorization, uh, their own databases, um, and kind of all their own separate processes of how to get those applications in production and how to support them. Um, so we did kind of a application modernization there in addition to a uh, cloud migration and server modernization strategy, right? Um, so we, uh, we introduced uh, Docker Trusted Registry uh, at first, uh, and then used uh, Docker Engine uh, by itself to do those deployments. Um, and then, uh, so what we kind of saw with the applications was that previously, uh, before Docker, right, the development cycle was very long, it was cumbersome due to these big monolithic application stacks. Um, and then as we move towards containerizing these microservices to these microservice architectures um, and bringing over those applications, uh, we saw that development cycle shrink down, right? So instead of doing things like waiting for uh, infrastructure to be deployed by an operations team and then uh, for it to be configured uh, specifically for that application, all those things shrunk down significantly um, to where uh, currently uh, it takes a, a matter of, you know, a few minutes. Uh, for a application developer to push their code into a test environment for evaluation. Uh, while previously that would have had to have been handed off to an operations team and tickets would need to be subgraded um, and you'd be looking at, you know, a week or two instead of minutes, right? Uh, so the new kind of common services platform that we've built for them focuses on building those business specific applications, uh, which are those images and containers and leaving the rest of the uh, common pieces as part of an underlying platform. Um, so we're using Docker to kind of drive that abstraction between the microservices and applications and the platform itself. Uh, and by implementing the solution and using infrastructure as code and configuration management and modern software development with containers, uh, we're able to eliminate the configuration drift um, so, and reduce the attack surface area uh, from developers and external. Uh, so now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jimmy, who's going to talk about uh, kind of our, our other services uh, that we offer. Sure, thanks. So my name is Jimmy Pham. Just a quick uh, kind of intro in terms of my role at Booz Allen. As Dan mentioned earlier, I lead our uh, modern software development service offering, if you will, um, and that pretty much covers a subset of certainly DevOps, uh, Agile, UX, as well as uh, microservices and enterprise modernization. And one of the um, common questions that I always get is, hey, can you do DevOps or move to microservices uh, architecture and design without containers or without the cloud? And you know, my answer is pretty simple. Technically, yes, you can do that. Uh, but the real question is around, do you want to do that and will you get the benefits that you're looking for in going down that path and trying to reproduce um, a bunch of scripts to actually do a mutable packaging of things where it makes a ton of sense um, going down and modernizing to a container architecture using Docker, as um, you know, Josh and other people have mentioned in this call earlier. Um, so once you kind of understand and demystify that whole portion around containers and Docker, which is kind of providing the, the foundation for a lot of these things, what we do offer and where we've seen a lot of success is, okay, so now that we have that and we agree on that, um, how do we move forward? Um, there's a couple of elements that are critical in terms of success. Certainly part of it is having a strong DevOps practice uh, along with a very robust uh, delivery pipeline to actually control the flow from code check-in and packaging using containers and being able to deploy it into a common runtime environment in a CAS or a PaaS. Um, 
as part of that, we actually uh, partnered with O'Reilly and we were able to publish our framework based on our success, uh, our success uh, experience in actually helping uh, government organizations uh, adopt and implement DevOps. And you can certainly download that book. Um, you can search for Enterprise DevOps Playbook um, on Google uh, and you'll get a link to O'Reilly to download that. Um, the other piece that's important is around enterprise modernization. Um, this was alluded earlier as well. Certainly, um, success from transformation is not just all technical. There's an aspect to it in, around how to rationalize your actual portfolio of applications. And Banjot mentioned that earlier, you know, which applications kind of are ideal to make sense to kind of replatform right away. That's certainly a good first step. I mean, the other elements around that is to have a strategy and a roadmap around um, which applications would make sense uh, to replatform, which ones are more legacy that requires a lot of uh, re-engineering uh, and sort of modernization efforts. Um, but also an assessment around how well the organizations and the structures is in place to actually run this type of uh, infrastructure and environment in production. Uh, certainly operating a production system uh, with containers is different than what uh, most organizations are used to right now. Um, and as part of our enterprise modernization offering, we help our customers kind of rationalize that and understand what type of org structure and cultural changes are needed and also a strategy around um, you know, which applications uh, will be replatformed first, followed by some modernization efforts going, going forward. Um, and then the, the last aspect I want to touch on is around uh, modern SD. So we kind of look at that from four elements, uh, agile, a user experience, uh, and security. And with DevOps being your philosophy, your practice, as well as your tool set, to kind of make sure those elements are integrated end-to-end uh, -end in a CI-CD uh, automated process. Um, and the importance of that is, you know, you can certainly deploy multiple times a day, but if no one wants to use the application or have confidence in it, um, you're also dead, dead in the water. So those four elements uh, are what we truly believe are a core in terms of modern SD. And then the last piece is around microservices. A lot of conversation, certainly a lot of uh, different opinions and, uh, and things that need to be demystified with microservices. Um, but part of it is understanding a couple core elements with microservices. One is uh, how to right size. There's no, um, no scientific way to do this. It's a matter of understanding the requirements and uh, breaking it down and decomposing into core independent uh, functions that make sense. So right sizing microservices is, is critical. The other piece is around dependency management. Um, and this is not a piece that has been talked about a lot, but it's certainly a very critical piece um, as far as developing, designing, and also operating microservices in, in the production environment. Um, you know, you want them to be as independent as possible, but there are certainly cases where um, a microservices is being uh, leveraged across and reused across several other uh, services or applications, and you have to be able to manage that in a very programmatic and a visible way. So dependency management of microservices as part of your pipeline, <clears throat> as well as uh, being able to see them in production and how they're operating is, is also critical. So those are definitely uh, elements in terms of, uh, you know, taking the concept of modern, modernizing to containers, but also being able to implement a strong DevOps practice as well as moving to a true um, kind of cloud native application is some of the stuff that we offer. So moving on to the next slide, uh, this is just a recap of you know uh, some of the next steps and how, how you can actually uh, reach us. Um, I mentioned the DevOps playbook. You can certainly follow that link or just search for Enterprise uh, DevOps Playbook and you'll be able to get to it from O'Reilly. And uh, if you want more information, feel free to uh, email us at modernappdev at uh, bah.com. Um, so as mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of work in the government and federal space in terms of these transformations. So we'll be more than happy to kind of provide some lessons learned or even some experience and direction um, if you guys are curious about that. Um, and some of these other um, links here as far as uh, Docker Enterprise in the federal space, go to docker.com slash government as well as learning more about the MTA process and the actual offering at docker.com slash MTA. So that's, that's about it. So I'm going to hand it back over to uh, uh, Benjot. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, I think that concludes the presentation for today. Melanie, if you're, you're back, we can hand it back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw that there was a couple um questions in the Q&A that um, you answered, but there's two that just popped up now. 
Um, so one says, do you have any metrics on how long an MTA engagement takes? Do you have it packaged as a week-long effort or does it depend? Yeah, I can uh, I can speak to that. So our, our MTA efforts are usually scoped as, as roughly week-long engagements. They typically take uh, just a couple days um, in terms of total amount of time, kind of hands-on keyboard. So a fair amount of that MTA is uh, getting folks familiar with Docker, getting them familiar with the Docker Enterprise capabilities, uh, and then it usually usually takes us within a day or two to convert your first application and get it get it into a container and then uh, actually have you up and running. We usually spend the next the next the last few days uh, hel helping customers get their next application. So we usually try to scope it to to one application for the MTA, and then uh, typically we'll, we'll end up doing two or three. Uh, in some cases, we've done as many as five or six. And then another question that just came in says, what kind of performance increase can I see with Docker? So this one I, I'd say is it's, it's you know, unfortunately it's, uh, it's, it depends. Um, so performance increases typically as a result of Docker uh, themselves, we, we find that, you know, just unloading some of the agents and the heaviness of the operating system, you do start to kind of free up resources on the exist on the existing environment or on your existing servers. That doesn't necessarily translate to faster applications. Uh, in in many cases, that means that uh, you pack more on the same same servers. So um, performance increases are are I would say. Uh, not typical in in MTA type environments. Uh, we typically just see folks that will go into the MTA, convert their application, and by the time they come out, uh, they're able to utilize that server much more than they could before. Okay, and I have another question that says, what CI tooling do you recommend most often? I'll actually I'll hand that to the to the Booz Allen folks. Uh, you guys have probably done many more engagements than than we have around uh, around CI. Uh, so CI and CD tooling is going to depend. There's a lot of different tools that will integrate well with with Docker uh, and the whole enterprise stack, right? Uh, so primarily, uh, you know, we usually see a lot of customers using uh, you know open source Jenkins uh, to to drive their pipelines. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's solutions from the kind of vendor side uh, for uh, doing deployment depending on what your needs are. So if you need, you know, advanced deployment strategies like uh, blue-green deployment or canary releases, things like that, then you need to start looking into kind of other capabilities, right, for, for things that aren't necessarily uh, built into uh, Docker Data Center uh, but are still capable by utilizing the APIs that are available to you. Yeah, hey, this is Jimmy. So, um, you know, one thing I would say about CI, CD, and the delivery pipeline is you do need to treat it like an enterprise workflow. Um, you know, Jenkins being at the heart, you know, cloud bees as well as the open source distribution of that being the heart of uh, job and task execution. Um, but, you know, what we would say is there's a lot of plugins for that. Uh, we certainly use, you know, build plugins and some other ones uh, with Jenkins, but just be aware there are other uh, tools. For example, if you're looking at release and deploy management, there's certainly uh, ZB Labs and some of the things that does that very well. Um, so just choose things that are geared towards uh, what it's meant to do versus trying to do like a Frankenstein approach and um, and customize uh, Jenkins and plugins to a degree where it's going to be hard to maintain. Um, you know, certainly the other aspects of the CI CD pipeline is you know automated testing and being able to do web hooks against uh, other tasks that you want to do, such as security scanning. Uh, so we see a lot of you know Sonar Cube being kicked off as part of the pipeline activities. Um, you know, and, and certainly uh, scanning containers, whether it's using Twistlock or even the Docker Enterprise uh, capability, is also uh, you know part of the, the pipeline that we see. Okay, a couple more questions coming in here. Does the MTA effort include the build out of Docker EE infrastructure, or is that needed prior to start? Do you leverage Docker Cloud to accelerate the engagement? So Docker EE is included as a part of the MTA, so standing up the, the Docker EE environment uh, is typically typically part of that engagement. 
Um, we don't leverage Docker Cloud uh, to to accelerate that. Typically, in in the environments we've been in, uh, and I, I can probably guess this may hold true for for uh, Booz Allen as well. The those environments typically don't allow uh, access or may not be using cloud uh, in many of those environments, and, and as a result, uh, we typically just deploy a, a Docker EE, sometimes that is on a cloud provider. So we, we have certainly worked with customers who are using AWS or Azure, you know, in their own VPCs uh, and, and will deploy inside, inside those VPCs, but in many cases, it's on, on their own infrastructure. Okay, so next question here. What about the vast majority of apps that cannot be containerized easily? How do we deal with them? Yeah, there there are uh, quite a few apps that, obviously, in, in the target that we've talked about for MTA, there are quite a few apps that fall outside of that realm. And that's not to say that those those apps cannot be Dockerized. Like I said, you know, we, we certainly see for customers, they, they have a lot of operational process around, say, uh, web sphere clustering uh, or web logic and and what we don't want to do is start with start start their onboarding into a docker environment with something that's typically very very hard to get right and so what we what we do is we start with the easiest apps which you know we're, we're targeting very cleanly as kind of your your web front ends or your your application servers and then we're we're slowly helping customers move uh, other existing apps into that environment. There, there are certainly apps that are not suitable to put into a Docker environment today, and that's those are those are apps that you know, I would tell you, you know, the the kind of clustered Oracle rack, or if uh, you know if you've got uh, kind of clustered application or uh, something that's very uh, uh, heavily dependent on a specific type of infrastructure or a specific type of type of hardware. Those are things that we're not we're not trying to dockerize today, um, and and I think those are things that will take time. And you know, for any of us, any of those folks that have been around and seen virtualization and the involvement of virtual machines, uh, I was at VMware for for many years. Um, you know, same same life cycle probably holds true. Uh, you'll see over time that those those hurdles will get crossed. Hey, this is uh, Jimmy. Just to kind of add on that, um, certainly we see a lot of that coming in for some of the legacy stuff, as well as you know, one pretty common example is you know having um, web applications that ride uh, on top of a, a pretty robust uh, Oracle Rack Active Active cluster. I mean, the, the way we approach that is we look at the like like Benji mentioned earlier at the web tier as well as the middle tier to see if that is um, capable of being partitioned off, right? And then we just leave that that Oracle cluster alone. Um, and you still certainly get benefits of that. Uh, but for more legacy or even mainframe type applications, we go through a, a, a transformation process where we help the customer look at uh, the application itself. And if it is worth the investment to actually modernize it, we start decomposing it into certain aspects of the functions. And then we just pull pieces out of that um, and create you know, a, a microservice or a container out of that um, and leave the core in, intact. So it's a gradual process, not a kind of overnight thing to containerize the entire thing. Yeah, great point, great point. Okay, and I think this might be our last question here. Um, it says, I have included Alpine in my Docker file on a few containers, but I have also created containers where I did not specify Alpine. It was a PHP app. Does Docker automatically utilize Alpine if I don't specify? No, it doesn't. Uh, so, so typically in the Docker file, you'll have a single line that says from, and that from from line is the base image that you're using. If you don't include Alpine, uh, we don't automatically pull Alpine and, and throw it in as the as the base image. Um, so it's possible to use uh, Scratch, uh, which is basically nothing, uh, as your your base image in the container. Um, I don't know, if Josh or Dan, if you guys. Have comments on like what's the what's the best base image to start with, or what are what are typically good ways to start uh, in terms of base base images in the container? I mean, so generally for uh, just getting started, right? You're, we're looking at images from Docker Hub that are kind of from library, right? So the official kind of Docker blessed images. Um, so whether that's Nginx or Node or, or something like that. Um, if you're once you're going towards you know operationalizing, you know you you're going to have to probably build your your own kind of base images, 
um, that include, you know, whatever security requirements your, your team has and whatever kind of tuning you need for production workloads. But I'd say just for getting started, um, using those images from Docker Hub are probably the, the best way to start. Okay, um, actually we, one more just popped in. This will probably be the last question we can take. Um, what about LAMP applications with clustered MISC IDP, excuse me, IDB, uh, do you have experience to Dockerize them? What do you advise in that situation? I think that's uh, MySQL. Um, so I think, yeah, for, my, for the MySQL databases, um, I would say, you know, just as we said for, for other clustered database, you can, you can leave those in place and start with, start with the LAMP stack first. So that's the easiest way to, to get going. Um, you can, you, we in fact have seen many, uh, many customers, in fact, there have been a number of surveys uh, citing, citing as high as, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the containers running out there are databases. I would suspect in most of those cases they're not, they're not clustered databases. They are literally single instances that, that uh, developers are, are developing against and just trying to, trying to get their schemas right. So I would say if you've got, uh, you know, clustered MySQL, you know, leave that leave that in place. Move the LAMP app and uh, try and get that working first. And once you've got those Dockerized, and you can connect connect uh, very easily back to your MySQL databases via the the Docker networking that's available. And then you can you can think about how you want to move uh, the SQL database MySQL databases over. But those tend to be trickier trickier deployments with MySQL and, and certainly with cluster database. Okay, I, I believe that is all the questions that we have um, in the Q&A panel here. Look real quickly. Yes, that was the last one. So um, thank you everyone um, for joining today. We really appreciate you taking your time out um, to sit with Docker and Booz Allen today. This does conclude our webinar. And just a reminder that this session was recorded and a copy will be sent out to you. And also be sure to register for upcoming Docker webinars at docker.com slash webinars and check out docker.com slash events for customer-facing webinars and events. So we thank you all again today for joining us, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.